So thank you very much. We are going to be looking at the, the importance of TB screening and testing. This is part of the HIV master classes, uh, which we host generally on Thursdays, but sometimes there's an overlap with some of the um, sessions. So just to uh, confirm with you that uh, there is no conflict of interest, everything that I'm going to be sharing with you um, this evening is based on the World Health Organization and TB strategy and also the consolidated guidelines on tuberculosis, then the South African National TB Screening and Testing SOP, uh, uh, which then you know gets into the details on how you could actually um, achieve this. And there's also some information around uh, the study, the targeted universal test, uh, TB testing study. Um, not a lot of research, but more, you know, focused on the, the care for patients and what is it um, that we need to be doing um, on a daily basis. I do have some polling questions. Maybe let me start with the first one just to get a sense of how you are doing um, in January. Um, how are you feeling today? Do you see the question in front of you? Are you feeling great? Uh, are you just okay? Are you sad? Um, all our polling questions would be opened just for 30 seconds today. If you do not get a chance to vote, uh, please bear with us uh, because yeah, we have to manage the time as well. Yeah, so let's see so that I can show you how we are generally uh, feeling. Yeah. Yeah, so you can see that most of us are feeling great. Uh, some people are okay, like me. So I'm hoping that by the end of this session, I would be inspired uh, to feel great. And if you are feeling sad, uh, we are with you, whatever it is, you can always reach out um, to us if you need someone um, to talk. But I think at least for the next hour, uh, I would like to just uh, leave you uh, inspired. Uh, yeah, so thanks again uh, for joining and for participating. It's all um, appreciated. So yeah, so the outline is that there's just for me to share with you how we are doing around TB globally and to start to introduce the concept of systematic TB screening as per the WHO recommendation. Then we look at what does targeted universal testing for TB mean? Then we look at the FAST approach as uh, presented by the South African government, uh, because I know that we've got our colleagues from all other countries always joining us. And then we would then look at uh, TB testing algorithms. And now if you do test, how do you interpret the results? It is no longer that straightforward. There are things that you need to, to consider. Otherwise, you are likely to misdiagnose uh, more than half um, of your of your everyday clients. So yeah, so why is this topic important? Because every single year we've got uh, over 10 million people who become sick uh, from this uh, bug TB and only about 5.8 million people were diagnosed in 2020. So already you can see that there is a, there is a gap, right? The, the gap between those who are diagnosed and notified versus those who become sick. So that means we do we do have a gap of a timely identification of people who might have TB and then using all the different resources to ensure that they are diagnosed um, timely. But you also see that 1.5 million people die from TB each year. Uh, you know, in, in certain countries, TB is a leading cause of death amongst people living with HIV, including here in South Africa. However, in South Africa, TB is a leading cause of death. So that means we have more TB deaths than vehicle accidents and many other things that are happening on a daily basis. So it is that important um, infection which we have to, to deal with. Also, you know, the question is as well, is this a, a disease we can eradicate? That's why there is what we call the end TB strategy. And you can see that the, between the year 2015 and 2021, we only managed to reduce the number of new TB uh, cases by 10%. Uh, that, is not, <laughs> that is not enough. You know, if I remember, we used to say uh, uh, zero uh, uh, HIV, um, HIV and TB infections. Uh, but uh, you know, we are, we are, we, if you are reducing your annual new cases by 10%, we are not going to, to get far. 
So we are hoping that by the year 2025, which is in two years time, we would have reduced the incidence by 50%. Um, which is still not going to be enough because in a in a good world we do not have um, TB. If you look at access to TB preventative treatments, whether it's INH prophylaxis, um, 3HP, whatever regimens that are being used, you know, in between these uh, particular years, only 42% of people who are eligible um, got it, and mostly it's people living with HIV and AIDS, but when you look at TB contacts and other people who might be at risk of getting TB, we have not done so well. And the goal is that by last year, we should have uh, initiated in excess of 30 million people on TB preventative treatment. So you see that these goals, we are generally not doing um, um, that well. Also with regards to access um, to treatment, for up to 2021, just uh, 26 million people accessed treatment for all ages, so it includes children and adults, adolescents. By last year, we were supposed to have 40 million people, but we know that we are quite uh, far uh, uh, from this particular goal. Like I said, TB remains a leading cause of death. You know, um, we, and 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 rather than getting to zero <laughs> TB related deaths, we have only managed to reduce this uh, to 5.6 percent, and our target should be 75 percent reduction in the next two years. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in the TB space. I know that there's a lot of research uh, currently ongoing to simplify regimens to look at TB diagnostics. But I think there's health systems challenges as well, uh, which need to be um, um, addressed because if TB is a disease that is curable, so why are we continuing to have the deaths? If we have treatments that work, which are able to cure, uh, what is the challenge? So most of the things have to do with how the health system itself um, is organized. So looking at how TB is going globally, then there is the what we call the global end TB strategy, which has three pillars, you know, I won't say much, but the focus is around integrated person-centered care and prevention. So the whole care for the patient, ensuring that we have the drugs, you know, TB, HIV integration, you know, ensuring that we've got the strong policies and governance and support systems to ensure that these services reach those who really need them and also you know investments in research and innovation and we have seen a lot of drugs coming through a lot of diagnostic tests coming through but for today our key focus area is just on this particular part you know where we talk about that early diagnosis of tb so the focus on early diagnosis of tb including universal drug susceptibility testing and systematic screening of contacts and high-risk groups. So we are going to be talking about this systematic screening. So there is a big goal there to say, actually, you know, uh, the, the assessment of drug susceptibility is no longer an option. It's something that should be universal, but also we want to get to universal um, TB screening and testing um, as we go through it. So, why is TB screening, you know, overall, you know, why is it important in the overall uh, care uh, regarding TB? Basically because it's the door, it is the entry point. You know, if we are not screening people for TB, we are not going to be able to identify uh, people who might have symptoms or people who might be asymptomatic and, and having the disease. We are going to have delays in the diagnosis and that usually leads to more and more people becoming infected, but also people presenting very late with complications, you know, um, um, and, and us losing them. So basically screening is the entry point, but importantly as well, it enhances our ability to diagnose um, TB and for high risk populations, this becomes even more and more um, important and if you remember all the TB preventative treatments, uh, whether it's INH prophylaxis or the three months regimen, the 3HP, the entry or the access to those um, treatments relies on our ability to provide um, TB screening. So very, 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 a very valuable um, intervention in the TB program. So I have a question for you. So for which of these uh, populations, uh, number one up to seven here at the bottom, 
is TB screening recommended? So who should be screened uh, for, for, for TB screening? I'd like to see what you think. Um, you can, you are able to select more than one um, option depending on your view. Uh, for which of the populations below is screening for TB recommended? All right, I see you guys are participating. I'll show you shortly um, how you have uh, participated. Uh, you have 10 more seconds. So let's all uh, try to participate and, and see how it goes. All right. Um, um, I must apologize because I'm about to stop the poll. So forgive me for that. So let me uh, maybe allow for a few more people to vote. Yeah, so let me stop and, and show you what it looks like. Um, so most of us believe people living with HIV and AIDS should be screened. And I think the two uh, follow-up ones are people who are malnourished with diabetes or history of TB and then contacts. So if you are in contact with someone uh, diagnosed with TB and then the rest follow, right? So you can see how it looks like. But as we are going to discuss, it is probably all these groups, right? It's probably, I don't see any group uh, amongst the seven uh, that I would regard as low risk uh, for TB prisoners because it's a closed environment, migrants because of many social ills they, they tend to, to go through. If you are in contact with someone diagnosed with TB, high risk. Um, uh, if the, the general population, so, and in South Africa, this is probably number four is very important because we are regarded as probably the top uh, five countries with regards to the burden of TB. So generally we should be screening everyone in the country uh, pending our capacity. You know that TB in the mines, especially gold mines, very, very, very high risk, um, malnutrition, um, immunosuppression and, and HIV. So all of them are more of these uh, options. So you would see that if you go through the WHO guidelines, which were published in 2021, you would see that the recommendation is that systematic screening for TB is recommended amongst household and close contact people living with HIV, minus exposed to silica. Silica is a byproduct of um, um, gold. So this is specifically for gold mines. Uh, prisoners, you know, and uh, internally displaced persons, which is where we're talking about um, the migrants. And the biggest question, as you see um, at the bottom there, it's, well, if we know that these are the people we need to implement some form of um, screening program, so how do we do it? What tools um, can we use? If you use those tools, you know, what would the algorithms um, look like and what is the best model you know, um, depending on how the country's health systems um, um, are organized, right? So you see that the recommended tools for screening by WHO is these four. Uh, symptom screening uh, here, whether, you know, any cough or any t t uh, TB symptoms, so you'll see whether it's fever, weight loss, uh, loss of appetite, drenching, night sweats. Uh, chest x-rays are now regarded as a very important um, screening and 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 please pay attention to the to the to the kinds of words we are using the screening I didn't say diagnosis we know we've been using uh, some of these uh, tools for diagnosing TB but now things are shifting where some most of the tools we used to use to diagnose are now recommended for screening right? Uh, computer aid. So now there's even the use of um, technology and artificial intelligence, which is able to evaluate x-rays uh, without the presence of a health worker and, and give you some form of differential or even diagnosis. And we can also use uh, um, molecular tests like your gene experts um, um, and so on. So this is very, you have, you have to shift your mind because traditionally we used to say, 
when we say the word screening, we mean questions. Then you confirm your screening with a test, let's say your sputum via your gene expert. But now there are populations where even a gene expert uh, has to be used for both screening um, and diagnosis um, at the same time. And we will discuss um, that uh, very shortly. So when you look at symptom screening, you know, it's something that we have been implementing, um, I think, throughout the world. But in South Africa, it is sort of a standard that every person who visits a public health facility, they would then be screened using questions. Are you coughing? You know, do you have uh, weight loss, uh, fever, night sweats? You know, and it's got great benefit. The benefit is that it's easy. So as I talk to you, I can screen you and assess whether you are at a higher risk of having um, TB or not. It's feasible. It requires very few things. It's probably the cheapest uh, screening tool we have because it is reduced really to, to, to questions. But it's got also limitations. It is less sensitive uh, compared to so its ability to pick up if someone might be having TB or not is probably at the lowest side, right? And also if someone has a asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic um, type of TB, so they do not have symptoms. And we see this a lot in people living with HIV and AIDS. You see them today, you say, are you coughing? They say, no. Are you losing weight? No. And you start them on ARVs, a day later, they are coming back coughing um, and so on. And I think this particular um, table on your right hand side, very, very, very crucial because what we have is the different modalities for screening, you know, whether it's a cough on its own or any cough, uh, a combination of TB symptoms, a chest X ray, a chest X ray that has uh, 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 obvious abnormalities versus any abnormality. And then you've got your molecular tests like your gene experts, your LPAs and, and so on. And you would see when you look at sensitivity, so the ability of this screening test to pick up someone who, who, who is likely to have TB, you would see that your X-rays, right, have the highest um, sensitivities, right, and very good um, specificity. So if this uh, X-ray does pick up that someone might be having TB, what is the probability that that is truly, you know, um, TB? So very, very, very good. If you look at your molecular test in, in, in combination, really, you see that the sensitivity is a bit low, but very specific. So if your gene expert comes back positive, there's a, it, the, the chances that you have TB, very, very, very high, right? Though you must pay attention that you can still miss some uh, patients. And our screening tool there is the weakest link, right? <laughs> or the, the questionnaire, I mean, 0 0.42, 0 0.5, you are likely to miss almost 50% of patients who might be having um, um, TB. So this is quite um, um, important as we go through these tools and we are just looking at TB screening um, right there, right? Um, do share your questions in the Q&A as I go. I'm not able to see the chat, but yeah, I'm hoping um, when I'm done, I'll check out the chat and then we can have uh, further um, discussions there. So chest X-ray, um, which is an imaging tool, we are not, we are, we, we, we are now all familiar with what an X-ray is, but it is now something which is fully recommended, uh, you know, especially in high prevalence settings like ourselves. So the benefits is that it is able to pick up TB. The sensitivity is quite high. Um, it can also identify people who are not coughing, if you do an X-ray and you find an abnormal X-ray, you know, but when you are asking questions, they had nothing, it can be used for triaging. Also, it can help you with a differential diagnosis, depending how the X-ray looks, you know, and there's a potential also in monitoring because if the X-ray was very bad and as you give treatment, it's getting better and better, you can get a sense that your patient is improving. However, X-rays cannot detect extrapulmonary TB, uh, you know, unless if it's an obvious uh, uh, plural effusion or something like that. But you might have TB in the joint and a chest X-ray might not help. It's not very um, specific. And there's always a risk of exposure to, to radiation. And then in our setting as well, the interpretation of X-rays is quite difficult. So we do not have sometimes enough uh, skills to interpret. We do not have a, a lot of trained people, but also the same X-ray, if, if two people look at it, 
you know, you, you can get two different <laughs> interpretations, you know. And then also the modern ones, your, your high quality digital X-ray imaging in our setting, we still have um, access um, issues. And you see there that WHO now recommends now a chest X-ray as an effective screening test for, for pulmonary um, um, TB. This is very important. The shift from relying on, on symptoms only right, to now say symptoms are not good enough. We, we, we have to introduce other um, methods of screening uh, for TB, right? I hope you are listening because I have a question for you. <laughs> so what are some of the disadvantages of x-rays for screening for TB, right? Uh, let me, uh, 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 I don't want to give you an answer because I was just teaching, so I just want to see that you are following uh, colleagues. So, is it uh, uh, the fact that we don't have people, poor sensitivity, uh, inter, intra uh, uh, exposure? So what are some of the disadvantages? <laughs> hey. All right, few more seconds. Few more seconds. All right, two more seconds. Yes, I have to stop, unfortunately. It's a marathon. Yes, I'm going to stop and then um, show you um, your answers. Yes, remember uh, with chest X-rays, sometimes you need your radiologist, which we might not have. Um, they have good sensitivity. So poor sensitivity is not a disadvantage of X-rays, right? There might be a lower a specificity. So their ability to pick up if someone has TB is actually quite high. It's 90 something percent, right? So uh, option two there, you wouldn't select it. And yes, intra-reader. So if you give Dr. Mawela and Dr. Mabuza the same x-ray, they might tell you two different things sometimes. And then obviously for you to do an x-ray, your patient or even you yourself as a health worker might be exposed um, to, to radiation. So remember, in for 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 screening uh, purposes, X-rays have a high um, um, sensitivity. Uh, because this I had already covered, I'll just go back just to show you, right? So it's very sensitive, right? Very sensitive, and as well, remember the table where I said you must compare. Here's your chest X-ray. You can see the sensitivities there. You know, up to ninety-four percent though the specificity, you know, it's on the um, lower side. So quite um, important for you to appreciate um, um, this particular question. Now the world has moved on, you know, as health workers, we are running a risk of being replaced, but we shouldn't see it like that. We should actually see technology as an enabler, uh, something that can enhance, you know, our work especially in the context of not having enough uh, human resources, uh, especially at a technical um, level. So a lot of studies have validated this computer-aided detection softwares integrated with X-rays, uh, you know, which they are able to tell you, you know, uh, they interpret the X-rays, you know, and can be used in the absence of a trained human reader. Imagine if you have this CAD, system in every clinic in the country and nurses don't have to always refer people for x-rays. They can just do the x-ray and this uh, machine just says beep, beep, possible TB or something like that, you know. Uh, it also enhances and facilitates the human resource capacity, I think, when used with the, with the human reader. So when now you combine it uh, with the capacity where you do have people who can look at it, it can actually help to say which ones and uh, you can send home which ones they need to be seen by a doctor so that doctors don't have to see people with normal um, x-rays all the time. It's quite efficient né? with time. You can actually do the x-ray, get the results in less than um, a minute. You know, Also, the way the reports are done, it's standardized, so it's easy then to, to compare you know, the interpretation of this. And also, it can be used for different uh, program goals. But obviously, they always come at a cost. Uh, these kind of things. And also it is not validated for children less than 15 years. Please don't forget this. So it's not recommended to use um, x-rays. Could, Could you try again? Oh, I think my Siri on my, on my watch is listening. <laughs> All right, yeah. So, and also- Siri, I'm still not sure. Hey, sorry guys, I think it's just technology. Yeah, so, and also 
it may not be as accurate uh, in people with TB scarring. So if it's an old um, um, abnormality on the X-ray, the system might not be able to differentiate between new versus old, you know, so, and there's still a lot of research around, you know, its ability to pick up disease in other populations, including people living with HIV and AIDS. But, uh, and I'll tell you why this is important. You're gonna see later why I'm showing you all this screening uh, tools as recommended uh, in the in the in the world right and then lastly which is the fourth one so remember we, we started with symptoms we discussed a chest x-ray we discussed a chest x-ray integrated with some artificial intelligence a system which is able to pick up abnormalities and suggest uh, uh, that this is possibly TB or not. And then the fourth uh, recommended screening is actually the test, like your gene expert, uh, which we are using um, in the country, your molecular or DNA tests. And the benefit is that something like gene expert is very highly um, specific, you know, so if it picks up, if you have a positive gene expert, there's like a hundred percent chance that the person has TB, you know, has TB and nothing else. It's actually TB, right? But remember, like I said, the sensitivities vary, especially in people who are smear negative or who are, are children who swallow their sputums or even people living with HIV and AIDS. And in most countries, these tests are now decentralized, you know, where uh, rural clinics or hospitals now have cartridges and they can be used, right? The limitations is that they require a lot of resources because you must always buy cartridges, you know? And people who cannot produce sputum, you know, it becomes weaker and weaker and can result in false positives, you know, especially in low prevalence settings. But in our settings, um, it's a high prevalence setting, therefore it's a very valuable um, test. So, and remember a negative gene expert would not exclude um, TB in an HIV positive patient. So this is quite um, important and, and crucial, right? So we dealt with the, with the uh, four um, um, recommended tools um, that uh, we can use. Now, before I tell you about children, what is your take? So considering the, the tools I have showed you, which ones do you think are recommended for children less than 15 years? Which ones would be recommended for screening? So if you have a seven-year-old, what would you use uh, for screening a child who's less than 15 years? I know this one I haven't showed you. I just want to test your thinking. What would you use? Um, and then I'll just show you in the next slide what the, the, the recommendation is uh, for, for, for children, right? So a few more seconds. <laughs> you still have 15 seconds to participate. Uh, <laughs> cool, cool, cool. All right. So, yeah, so I mean, with children, it will always be a challenge because most of these screening tools uh, become, you know, less um, reliable. I mean, something like a gene expert, children generally, how are you, if a child is not having TB symptoms, how are you going to get the sputum? And even if you do, they're likely to swallow it, you know, and so on. So, um, symptoms probably very important and x-ray very important, but you have to be cautious as well and not expose children to unnecessary um, radiation. So the recommendation from WHO is that they classify um, 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 children into two groups. So you've got child contacts of people living with TB. This is irrespective of HIV status, right? So if there's a child who is a contact of an adult living with TB, and uh, we're talking about children less than 15 years, the recommendations are to use your symptom screening and a chest X-ray, right, for, for, for that, right? And then for children living with, um, for children living with um, HIV, um, the recommendation is to, is to use um, symptoms, right? And then also, um, um, the, the fact that they have a contact. So basically, if you have a child who's living with HIV and AIDS and there's a TB contact, they should be screened every time there's a new contact. Basically, that's how you would interpret it. And you will see it um, later on when we, we discuss. That's why 
the, 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 the regular screening of children who are living with HIV and AIDS is such an important um, intervention. But if you are talking about um, children irrespective of um, their HIV status, you know, um, therefore an X-ray is, is something that um, we need to do. So for routine screening, right, routine screening, remember in HIV, there is routine screening every visit, there is no recommendation um, to use um, a chest X-ray, but if there is a contact, a chest X-ray can be um, added. Basically that's the um, interpretation right there, right? So, so what, what is driving the change? What is driving the change? Why do we need to change the way we are screening? And I want to tell you just about uh, this uh, study, which is, called, which is called the Targeted Universal Testing for TB. So U, UTT, at, okay, so it's not, you see, I'm used to, <laughs> to universal test and treat in the HIV world, uh, in the TB world, there's that first T, so it, it, it's TUT or T, uh, T-U-T-T, <laughs> all right, but basically what they've done is to look at the standard of care, remember currently, and this study uh, was done in, in South Africa particularly, and remember the current standard before the new protocol was that if a person comes in into the clinic you would ask them a set of questions are you coughing do you have loss of weight and if they do have any of these symptoms you would then collect sputum and send it for a gene expert right so they said fine in the first group or your control arm we are going to just continue the status quo as per the standard in the then intervention arm we said fine let's change things a bit right? People come in, you still screen them and say, do you have symptoms uh, or not? And if someone has symptoms, it's the same. You collect sputum and you send them for a gene expert. However, irrespective of symptoms, right? Whether you have symptoms of, or not, if you are HIV positive, you, previous, you, you previously had TB, or you have a history of being in contact with someone who has TB, you would also get a gene expert um, and culture. I hope you can see the difference, right? In the control arm, we were not doing a risk assessment. We were just saying, do you have symptoms or not? If you have symptoms, you get a gene expert. In the intervention arm, we're saying, we still screen you. If you have symptoms, you get a gene expert. But irrespective of whether you have symptoms of, or not, if you are HIV positive, previous TB or a TB contact, you would get a, 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 an expert right there. And obviously one wants to see whether we are going to pick up more cases in the intervention arm versus the standard practice, which we are currently using um, in the country. And the, the results are very, very, very um, interesting, right? And you can see the enrollment, you know, in excess of 30,000, participants or tests were done, the overall pickup rate, right? <clears throat> the yield was um, 6%, right? But then you need to pay attention to a few things, uh, you know, when you now uh, subclassify the overall, right? Obviously, if someone presented with symptoms and we send them for a gene expert, we would be expecting a higher yield. You can see there, 10%. But who would have expected a yield of 4% for people who had no symptoms? So if you take Dr. Mawela, as I speak to you now, I'm not coughing, I don't have anything, and you send me for a gene expert, who would have expected that Dr. Mawela would come back uh, with TB? Very important. The, if you look at the overall pickup rate for people who had HIV, it was 5%, which is quite uh, significantly you know, high. And if you were HIV positive and you were you had symptoms, that means we would have referred you for gene expert anyway. We had the highest uh, pickup rate, I think now 9.7%. But look at this, a huge number of HIV positive patients who had no symptoms. I'm not coughing, I'm not losing weight. No, I don't have night sweats. I'm okay, I'm just HIV positive. The close to 4%, there was a 4% 4, 4 uh, a pickup rate. Uh, in this particular group, right? Remember which ones are these, your HIV positive asymptomatic is these ones. 
Uh, because if they had symptoms, you would have done it anyway. But someone who says, no, I don't have symptoms, but they are HIV positive who are referred for a gene expert, which is not standard practice um, um, currently in the, in the country. You move on, you look at TB contacts, you see. So being a TB contact, irrespective of whether you have symptoms or not, it's a huge risk for one um, to have um, TB. Uh, if, if you are if you are a TB contact with symptoms, very high risk, right? You see it there. But as well, a TB contact without symptoms, six percent pick up rate, right? Then, previous TB, right? This is a group that we, we 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 which is very important. So, in other words, if I talk to you and you had TB last year, there is a probability that <laughs> you would have TB. Uh, again this year. Look at the 12%, 14%. If you are previous TB and symptomatic, very, very high, very risky. But also someone who completed TB treatment successfully and they don't have symptoms, a good proportion of those patients um, do have um, 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 TB. So what does this, if you look at it, what does it tell us? You know, what does it tell us? It means going back to this slide, the reliance, the over-reliance on the symptoms, right? For TB screening, uh, we, we, are we are currently basically missing a, a lot of uh, patients, right? Because uh, symptoms on their own, um, they are not, basically, if you don't have symptoms, we assume that you don't have TB. But now this particular report tells us that there is a lot of people who are asymptomatic, no symptoms. That means we would have missed them on the standard screening tools, but they do have um, TB. And we would have sent these uh, uh, people home and uh, they continue to spread the disease in the community, which is very, very, very crucial. So the conclusions uh, from this particular study is that systematic screening with expert or culture diagnoses more patients, uh, basically, right? And clinics who are practicing the standard practice, which is just relying on symptoms, are going to miss um, a lot of, of patients, you know? And if you implement targeted, so we are not just saying, because we know we can't afford universal uh, uh, test testing of TB, like every person who comes in the, into the hospital, uh, you know, <laughs> do a gene expert. But targeted then means there are subpopulations where uh, if we come across them, we have to not rely on just the symptoms. We have to uh, provide a gene expert um, 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 test uh, for those groups um, of patients, right? So, yeah, I see your questions, and I think some of them, uh, uh, we are still going to, to go through them. So I, I'm hoping you are, you are following the story, right? And... and um, there are communities, you know, uh, through fundings and, and NGOs uh, who have access to, to digital X-rays, uh, sometimes with the computerized aided, and I'm talking in, in South Africa. And you can see this uh, nice slide by Dr. Lucy Cornell uh, from, from Right to Care, you know, putting together some of the high burden uh, sort of uh, districts where there are containers you know, um, that had uh, uh, these digital x-rays. And basically, all they're trying to do here is to look at, you know, the pickup rate again, you know, PHC head count testing positive. So what was the, 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 the test positives at the PHC level uh, before, if you compare um, um, without the digital x-ray and with the digital x-ray, right? So, so just the just by just introducing uh, uh, X-rays, you can actually improve uh, your pickup rate very, very, very significantly. You look at Eshanzeni, which is this district I'm presenting from in Del Sprint, uh, uh, where you find the Bombella there. And you can see that the pickup rate was it is this rate. You can see almost threefold, right? From 0.1 to 2.3. So a threefold increase in the in our ability to pick up. A, a, a TB and and which probably in the standard practice relying on symptoms, um, um, a good proportion of patients would have been missed who have um, TB and you can see it across all the regions where um, um, this particular project was able to place digital X-rays uh, containers in communities 
and, and to increase you know, the pickup rate. So you can see that 28% of all people diagnosed with TB in this phase of the project were asymptomatic and would have been missed. So the symptoms are good. We are going to continue to use symptoms. If someone is symptomatic, then we, 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 we sorry, I don't know why I have that message, yes. If someone is symptomatic, then we test them, but we, we need to have a plan for the asymptomatic people who might have a preclinical or subclinical um, TB disease. And that is really the message uh, behind my presentation to you, right? So having seen <laughs> some of these and remembering some of the slides, what do you think are some of the, actually you don't think because I covered this, so please don't think, uh, just give me the answer. <laughs> what are the benefits of using computer-aided uh, uh, diagnostic uh, chest X-rays? You know, uh, do you think there's benefits? Do you remember what are some of the benefits of using X-rays, but with some uh, Siri or some artificial <laughs> intelligence? Yeah, I hope you remember some of them. <laughs> there's just one key weakness. So there's one of these points uh, that you, actually two of them, which you should not choose. <laughs> so yeah, uh, five more seconds. All right, I'm hoping you are enjoying uh, this uh, talk. Okay. I'm going to stop, forgive me for doing that. <laughs> Uh, uh, let's look at them individually. Yes, it's very fast. So the, the, these systems are able to process X-rays in less than a minute. Yes, can be used in the absence of a trained radiologist or health worker. Yes, uh, can be cost. Yeah, they are not cost saving. They're actually expensive. And I think they become cost saving if we are able to have them and the, we use them, you know, for so volume wise you know, and, the, and the impact. But for now, they are still a bit um, expensive in a way. That's why we don't have them everywhere. And uh, uh, the, the, the fourth one there, reduced inter and intra reader variation. Yes, because now the report is standardized. So that is the impact. So what you are not supposed to select is the uh, cost savings. Maybe later we might have, the, but when you buy it initially, the investment is quite expensive. So we can always argue about three. But what the one we are sure about is that a CAT and able chest X-rays um, have not been validated for children less than 15 years. So don't, don't forget that. So they are not recommended. That's why you would see even for the screening, it's not fully recommended unless there is a clear contact uh, for that particular child, right? So let's get then into the South African guidelines. And then now I'll get into the details of some of the questions that I saw uh, being asked. So this is the procedure. It's a national document. It has been uh, signed off. I didn't ask the director if I can <laughs> present this, but uh, it was signed last year. So I thought since it's signed, I can share with you guys and we can engage on it. And uh, it, they call it the fast approach, finding people with TB actively, not passively. So that means we are no longer going to wait for people to become sick, but we are actively going to find them. If you find them, we separate them so that they don't infect other people and we smoothen the process to treatment um, as much um, as possible, right? And the goals are to improve the quality of TB symptom screening services, right? Also to give guidance on this universal TB testing of high-risk groups, though so there are groups that are targeted for universal testing. You see now the language, universal testing. So now we are talking test, there, there are groups where we want to test everyone and also to give you some details on how you can make this uh, very operational. There are many definitions in there, but I thought these three are very important. So we now talk about systematic TB screening, right? So it means screening of TB disease uh, following you know, some algorithms so that you can identify people with active TB and we go beyond the questionnaire. The questionnaire is still there, but now we start to introduce you know, X-rays and, and tests. And when we say someone is a household contact, we talk about a person who shares the same living space with uh, for one or more nights uh, 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 for or for extended periods up to eight hours during the day. So if you have stayed 
a night you visited your sister you stayed there um, overnight and she has tb you are a household contact or if you have spent uh, about eight hours during the day with the person you are a household contact and if this happened in the last three months then it's significant so when we can't say i was with her a year ago that's not significant but if it's within three months and it's eight hours during the day or overnight then you are a household uh, tb contact and then uh, how close were you, right? So if you shared a, a closed space, you know, like uh, in a house or a movie or something like that for more than 15 minutes, uh, you know, uh, with the index patient during the three months, then you are a, not only are you a household contact, you are a close um, um, contact, right? So very, very important because we, we will talk about how we manage contact. So, and obviously when we implement such procedures, we do not want to violate the rights of our patient. Remember, we are still going to ask people to cough. So you have to implement infection control practices, make sure that as a health worker, you are protected, you have the right PPE, and the, the, that the, also there is a dedicated safe space for sputum collection. Otherwise, as you collect, you are then spreading more and more um, of this um, TB. With regards to your infection prevention control, uh, screening is part of it, but we may have to educate people on how to cough. If someone has symptoms, how are we going to separate them from the other people? How do you ensure that, you know, in your clinics, we fast track people who are symptomatic, they don't stay in the queues and continue to spread. We ensure that we timely investigate, we start treatment and really help them to leave the hospital as soon as possible because the hospital or the clinic will always have people who are vulnerable. So these are like the principles for your um, IPC, which I don't want to get into detail about. Now the screening tool in the country has been reviewed as well to include some of the COVID symptoms. You know, I really doubt that there will ever be a person who has COVID who is not a TB, uh, uh, who, who is not a TB presumptive or suspected um, um, case because if someone is coughing and they have fever, whether they have COVID or not, you have to check for TB. But yeah, you know, we are trying to, to show you the difference. But for me, anyone who, who is a COVID uh, sort of a suspect, most likely you also have to check them uh, for TB. And you can see this is the TB symptom screening. I think what is very important, which you would see is this particular first part where we are trying to assess the risk because you'll see later when we discuss, so who is eligible for universal testing? It's some of these questions that you have to ask, you know, um, are you diabetic? Are you living with HIV? Have you, have you taken TB treatment in the past year? And then I'll show you uh, the subpopulations and how often should the testing uh, be done, right? The TB testing. Again, with regards to TB screening, there is now the app, then the TB health check. So sometimes whilst your patients are in the waiting area there, just uh, tell them, you know, to send a message. Firstly, save this number there as the National Department of Health 0860123456, and then send the word TB. Then they'll get questions. You know, you can test it now <laughs> as we speak see if it works, you know, it will ask you a number of questions. Are you losing weight? Are you doing this? And at the end, it will tell uh, the patient to say, um, you need to see a doctor or you need to visit someone. So by the time they get to a practice, they've already self um, screened with the questionnaire, at least then you can then assess uh, for, for, for the other um, uh, things, right? Now, this is now in the guidelines. Remember, I, I was building some information for you, but in the guidelines, chest X-ray screening is also recommended uh, uh, beyond the question, right? And for who? For people who are asymptomatic, right? So people who do not present with TB symptoms in a high TB setting. So if someone is asymptomatic, but you, you they, they've been exposed or things like that, you should probably do an X-ray or maybe they are from the mine, you know, probably an X-ray um, should be done because you know, in, in the mines TB, a minor is a high risk. People with symptoms um, other than cough, so they might, you know, um, 
you need to, to, to you might have to look deeper and do an x-ray. Patients who are symptomatic with a dry cough but cannot produce putam, so you cannot confirm um, TB or with, because uh, if they don't have sputum, most likely you won't be able to do your gene expert. So an X-ray um, can be done. Uh, current and former mine workers, you know, someone with chronic um, lung disease, you know, this is where X-ray screening um, is, 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 is fully uh, recommended. And you'll see that there are notes as well to say, uh, if chest X-rays are not available, you know, it should not be a barrier uh, for testing, which is now the collection of uh, sputums. And also chest X-rays are not recommended for children less than 15 years, unless uh, you are dealing with a child who is a contact and you are doing contact uh, investigating investigation for, for that child. For, but for routine screening, X-rays um, are not recommended. Um, also in the guidelines, all people presenting with any TB symptom must be tested uh, for TB, right? All people presenting with an abnormal X-ray must be TB tested. So if you ask me questions and uh, th there is a container for your um, um, chest X-ray or digital X-ray, you do the X-ray, it's abnormal, you still have to collect sputum. So X-rays do not replace um, the collection of um, sputums. And this is the algorithm at the community level, like those containers and those mobiles, uh, you know, ideal in the community, you would be screening people and asking them, are you coughing? Do you have loss of weight? If someone is symptomatic, then we must collect a uh, sputum for gene expert. And then hopefully, you know, the results are confirmed or not confirmed, right? Now, always the, the, the new protocol, the interest is around the people who are not symptomatic. So if you are screening in the community, and the person you are screening, they don't have symptoms and there is access to x-rays, you need to try and do an x-ray. So if you are in the uh, districts where, I, where I've showed you that there are these uh, mobile x-ray uh, things and containers for digital x-rays, in addition to your symptoms, people who are asymptomatic can be sent for x-rays. You know, if x-rays are negative, then there is really, you know, they are just negative, you know, it's fine. The problem is with asymptomatic patients who have an abnormal x-ray, you still have to collect um, a sputum and confirm whether this is um, TB um, or not. So this is at community level, right? Um, so the whole thing around x-ray is that ho hopefully at some point we will have a whole lot of um, these containers and we are able to offer x-rays to many people. Please don't ask me a lot of questions around where I'm going to get the x-rays, right? I will share the guideline with you as well and you can have a look. Now, if someone is presenting at a health facility at your hospital or clinic and you screen them for TB symptoms, right? There's questions you need to ask, right? Have you been previously treated for TB? Are you living with HIV? Um, have you been in contact with someone who is diagnosed with TB? If someone says yes to these three uh, questions, they are for universal testing. Now, this is crucial. That means going forward, if I, if you see Dr. Mawela today, you offer Dr. Mawela an HIV test and Dr. Mawela tests positive, you need to collect sputum, right? not just ask questions about coughing and so on. So, so very, very um, important. In other words, now when we say targeted, uh, 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 uni uni targeted universal testing for TB, who are we targeting? Uh, people who previously completed TB treatment, people living with HIV, and anyone who is a household. If you have spent a night with someone, who has TB or you have spent more than eight hours uh, uh, during the day with someone who has TB in the last three months, you are a household contact. Therefore, you need to be tested for TB, not just screened uh, with symptoms, right? So if, if for everyone who does not fall into these three categories, that's where you have an interest about symptoms because these three groups here, you would test them irrespective of whether they have symptoms or not, right? 
So if uh, I have never had TB, I'm not HIV positive, I'm not a contact, the question is, do I have symptoms now? I say no, then I'm fine. If I say yes, then you must collect uh, sputum from me. I hope you are taking pictures, but uh, you know, we will share the slides tomorrow, right? Uh, via emails, we will share with all of you. So don't worry. And you can see, so who's going to be, whose responsibility is it to collect sputums? <laughs> that is the biggest question. It's everyone. So if the patient is seen by a doctor and they answer yes to these three questions or they have symptoms, the doctor or the nurse, you must collect specimens and document and do everything. The lay counselor is, should be able to collect the, the specimen. The community health worker collect the specimen, but remember, Infection prevention control, very important, a dedicated area for collecting specimens, and you must protect yourself. You should have appropriate uh, PPE uh, uh, during um, um, this process. So a risk assessment is part of this process because you are going to identify people who need to be tested or not. You know, uh, people with chronic medical conditions, previous uh, TB, you know, have you been in close contact with someone who has TB? Are you being abused by alcohol or substances? Are you um, malnourished? Because these are generally people who are at a higher risk um, of getting um, um, TB. Take a picture of this slide because everything we are discussing at the end is this question. So who must be tested? Please look at it in the South African SOP. Though WHO would call this screening using molecular tests, in the in the in our guidelines, there's still a separation between screening and testing. So the guideline says you can screen with questions, you can screen with an X-ray, but you test, right? So we talk about when you say universal testing, we're talking about people who need to get a gene expert, mandatory gene expert. All people with any TB symptoms, right? People who are close contacts or household contacts, right? In the past year, and you can see here, they say, um, um, or, or who have been on TB treatment um, um, in, the, in the past year, irrespective of TB symptoms, right? I think here they're saying people who have been in close contact. So if I was, I had, I was on TB <laughs> treatment in the last year and you were in contact with me. <laughs> you need to <laughs> you need to be tested, right? People who have been treated or completed treatment in the past two years, right? So if I was on TB treatment in 2020 and you see me today, 2021, 20, uh, 2021, I think, yeah. Uh, whether I have symptoms or not, you need to test me. And you saw why, right? From the study, this group had the highest yield with regards to TB um, diagnosis. And then your newly diagnosed people living with HIV irrespective of symptoms. Remember, this is not new. We were doing it in the PMTCT program. We're already saying all women, once you test them, uh, I mean, all pregnant women, if they test positive, we're doing a gene expert, right? Because symptoms were becoming less reliable. Now we are saying for everyone, not just pregnant uh, HIV positive women, but all people, who are living um, with um, HIV, right? I saw a question, so I have a few more slides, then we can have a nice discussion if uh, your time allows. So uh, someone was asking, which I saw, so how frequent must we test uh, the people? So let's look at it. So the general population, okay, only test them when they present with TB symptoms or chest X-ray. So if your screening is positive for the general population, uh, only do the testing when they have symptoms, right? Or when they have presumptive TB or their TB suspects in the old uh, language, right? People living with HIV and AIDS, if you diagnose someone today with HIV, you need to collect a sputum for, 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 for gene expert, right? Um, and HIV positive women, I think this was already practiced, like I said, HIV positive pregnant women, a gene expert must be done. Then the last one says now annually. So this is important. Every time you have a person living with HIV on ARVs and they are due for their annual viral load, when you do that viral load, you must collect what? A sputum, <laughs> right? So it's now an annual test, right? For people living with HIV. When we do the viral load, we do the, the expert right there. Household contacts, right? After each exposure. So if... Um, 
I stayed with my sister last year in June and she had TB. You were supposed to have investigated me and done the testing. Now, now in Christmas, I visited my aunt. She had TB. You must repeat. So after every exposure. And then lastly, people previously treated for TB. So annually for a period of two years. So in other words, every person who completes TB treatment, let's say I complete TB treatment today and I'm okay. In 12 months time or within, let's say in 12 months time, you must collect my sputum. In the second 12 months, sputum. Then it means for this group of patients, they'll only get tested twice, presuming that they are HIV negative because if they are positive and they are also on ARVs, it will be annual for, for, as, for as long as possible. I hope <laughs> you are with me there. And I'm gonna close with the algorithms and uh, you, yeah. All right, so the recommended test, when we say testing, we are talking about the gene expert, right? That is the ultimate test. Now I'm going to go through the complicated part, which is the algorithms. Please uh, take a deep breath. I'm going to drink, uh, sip my water as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because algorithms put it all together. It's like four slides and then, and then that's it. And when you, the reason why we need algorithms is because of these three bullets. Remember, people living with HIV and AIDS may present with a negative gene expert. So a negative gene expert would not exclude the disease. So you need to further uh, assess them. So that is the first point of note, right? People who, are, who do not have symptoms, but they test positive. Very important uh, statement, this one. If someone who, who does not have symptoms, but the gene expert is positive, right? You need to do proper assessment. So don't just say um, they have TB. You also need to do a proper assessment and you might need to even collect X-rays and culture to confirm TB, right? Because otherwise you would miss your false positives. Yeah. Remember if they were symptomatic and the test is positive, you, you know, your, 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 your index of suspicion is very high. Now here you are dealing with someone who's not symptomatic and the test is positive. The question is, is this a true positive? Now you have to do further tests. That's why we need algorithms, right? And the last one is that in people who completed TB treatment in the past two years, so just remember that your gene expert test is not able to differentiate between live and dead. A TB bacilli, very important. So if you ask me, yes, I had TB last year, I completed TB treatment and you do a gene expert and it comes back positive. The question is, do I have TB? Is that live or dead? And the only way to differentiate that is to do a culture most of the time, right? Culture will then confirm that yes, uh, uh, this is a true um, um, TB. Unfortunately, my first algorithm is a very poor, poor, um, algorithm because I couldn't get it right uh, from the guideline. So I will try to redraw it and then share it with you. But I'm going to take you through it and then we will share the guideline and the slides as well. So here we are talking about someone who has a positive result. So you, you did an expert test and it came back positive, right? That is the first thing. So there's a question there which you must ask. I'm sorry that this is poor quality. The question says, has the decline so if someone has a positive gene expert and they have completed TB treatment in the last two years, right? So what are you worried about? You are worried that, yes, the test is positive, but is this test positive because your patient has active disease or because the DNA test is picking up DNA from dead uh, bacilli, right? So then you have to look at what does the result say? If the result says, positive but reef unsuccessful, it's obvious. You have to assess your patient and then collect sputum for culture and DST, right? Culture is good. If culture is, if something is growing on culture, it means you are dealing with live bacilli, not from the dead TB, uh, which was treated um, two years ago, right? If it comes back and says, you know, gene expert is positive, your patient uh, completed TB treatment in the last two years, and the reef is, uh, is susceptible. So this is normal and non-resistant um, TB. You need to confirm to take a smear from that patient. Now, remember, previously we were just taking a smear to check the two pluses and the three pluses so that after two months, 
the patient is smear negative. This time you are taking a smear to confirm that uh, your patient is truly having TB. So because your patient had was on TB treatment in the last two years, and your gene expert came positive. If the smear is positive, you've got two tests that are positive, and most likely your patient has TB. You're going to start your patient on drug sensitive um, TB treatment, right? So I'll share the algorithm. This one is not good quality, but I hope you are able to follow me um, as I explain it. And then uh, uh, lastly, is that your gene expert is positive. You are not sure whether these are alive or dead because your patient completed TB treatment in the last two years and the result says resistant, right? So this one, there's, a, there's two ways to figure it out. If the previous TB was not resistant and the current TB is resistant, obviously that would mean that uh, your patient has TB, right? Because the previous one was not resistant. The new one is resistant, for example, you know? So that's why here you'll say, if the, the, the previously treated TB, wa, let's start this side, had, yes, if the previously treated TB was susceptible, so during the two years, the TB was normal sensitive TB, now it is resistant, your patient has resistant TB, they need to get the RTB treatment, right? But if it says resistant, and also the previous one was resistant, so you are not sure, what do you need to do? A smear. If it's positive, then your patient has drug-resistant TB. This algorithm is addressing, in summary, is addressing two things. Number one, that if you are doing a gene expert test on someone who was on TB treatment in the last two years, and the gene expert is positive, you cannot be 100% be sure that your patient has TB, right? You then need to do a follow-up test, which is a smear. And if the smear is positive, it sort of confirms that your patient has um, TB, basically. That is, that is the, the rationale uh, behind this algorithm. I hope you, you got it. <laughs> All right. And then now this one says, uh, again, it's positive, right? So the result is positive, right? Uh, and your patient was never on treatment. So, so it's someone who's diagnosed maybe for the first time on TB or they, in the last two years, they were never on TB treatment. So you can trust the result. This is probably the easiest one. If it says resistant, you know, you have to do your, your, your reflex testing and do your cultures and refer for drug resistant TB. If it says susceptible, this is drug resistant TB, you treat with RIFA4, right? If it says Reef unsuccessful, you do start RIFA4 and send your second sputum for culture uh, to confirm resistance or not, and you act on the results. So this is the most, this is the obvious uh, algorithm without any issues. There are issues only if gene expert is positive and the person had TB in the last two years. Then you go to this poor quality algorithm of mine <laughs> there, right? And then um, the second last algorithm, then you get this funny result, right? That says gene expert is positive. It says trace. So it means it's a weak positive. It means it's a low threshold. So we are not sure whether it's a false positive or is a true positive. So if you see the result saying X gene expert trace on the thing, it means, you know, it's like on the split time we used to have scanty positive. I don't know if you remember if there's spheres, right? When we used to diagnose with spheres only. So if it says trace, you have the same question. Did your patient have TB in the last two years or no TB in the last two years? If TB in the last two years, you, you assess your patient, you are going to need to assess clinically. Is your patient having symptoms of TB? And then you probably need to do your, your, your culture here again. Sorry, I missed this part. Yes, TB culture and DST. So, so, so for a trace, you, you probably need to do culture for all your patients uh, with a trace, especially if they had completed TB um, in the last two years, right? So if it's trace in the last two years, assess your patient clinically, collect with them for culture, act on your clinical assessment and your DST and culture results, right? If it says trace and your patient has not been on treatment in the last two years, you actually now can make a decision on clinical assessment and an X-ray. If your clinical assessment and X-ray are suggestive of TB, you treat for TB, you treat for TB, sorry. 
And if uh, your patient is asymptomatic, the X-rays are normal, you continue with routine care. I think this is very, very um, easy um, um, and obvious, right? So you just follow the algorithms. <laughs> uh, and then lastly, the negative. So the negative remains the same, right? Remember the issue with a negative uh, expert is whether your patient is HIV positive or not. So if your expert result is negative, in an HIV negative patient, most likely your patient does not have TB. You need to assess and investigate for other things and review probably later. A negative gene expert in an HIV positive patient does not exclude TB. So you have to investigate further, do your X-ray, do your clinical assessment, give your patient you know, symptoms, I mean, sort of antibiotics for a week, you know, and see if there's clinical improvement, and then you decide. I think the key message around a negative gene expert, it's on this wing. A negative expert does not exclude TB in an HIV positive patient. If you have a negative gene expert in an HIV positive patient, collect another sputum for culture, but you can't wait you know, for six weeks for these results. Rather, you do a detailed clinical assessment, uh, give antibiotics, very basic, you know, ask your patient to come after a week, check them. You know, if they are not improving, most likely they have TB. If they're improving on antibiotics, most likely they don't have uh, TB, but do follow up on your culture results, this particular specimen there, because it will be very, very um, helpful. All right, so yeah, so in summary, I hope you are with me. Uh, all clients entering a facility must be screened for TB and COVID-19. Where available, a uh, chest X-ray can be used for TB screening, right? People who present with any TB symptoms uh, must be tested uh, using an expert. People living with HIV must have a sputum sample collected for TB expert, irrespective of TB symptoms. It's not me, guys. It's in the guidelines. <laughs> People who are close contacts of TB patients must have a sputum collected. People who have been previously treated for TB must have a sputum um, collected. Patients must be requested to return for the results in two days' time. Always offer an HIV test to people who do not know their HIV status or who have been tested more than three months ago. Right, right, right. Thank you, thank you, colleagues. I hope uh, this was a, a, a good marathon for you and you have grasped the whole concept of targeted universal testing uh, for TB.